wonderful and magnificent name of our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ. Welcome to the Wednesday night edition of MTV's Facebook Live Bible Study on behalf of the Mount Vernon Missionary Baptist Church located in Auburn, Alabama. We are affectionately known as the Church on the Hill. Sometimes we we'll even call ourselves the Holy Ghost Headquarters. I am grateful tonight to be uh, teaching you the Word of God. Evangelist Teresa Thomas, good evening to you. Uh, associate ministers are checking in. Uh, Miss Enette Reese, ushers are checking in. Call a neighbor, call a friend. If you know your enemies, you can call them too and invite them to join us tonight in the Word of God. Miss Jacqueline Adams, good evening to you. I trust that God is moving supernaturally in your life and that you are walking and moving in the Spirit. Remember our theme verse, Galatians 5.16, walk or have a lifestyle that's in the spirit of God and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Evangelist Frazier, good evening to you. That's our goal. Our goal is to deny our flesh and walk in the spirit and thereby please God. I told you last night, the Bible says that he that doeth right is right, even as he is right, or righteous even as, even as he is right. And it is time for the, all of us who preach and teach the word of God to challenge people to change. That's our mission, Miss Azella Wilson, good evening to you, is to challenge people to change. Remember the second Sunday, we will have our church picnic immediately after church. And you all are invited to come and eat somewhat unhealthily <laughs> hamburgers and fries and hot dogs and I really don't eat that kind of food but uh, I'm going to ch cheat on my diet that day and eat some hamburgers and some fries and some um, hot dogs okay that's the second Sunday also remember for the uh, those in our listening audience who our senior citizens, good evening, Mary Gunn. Um, the uh, Men in Action, MIA, the men of the Mount Vernon Baptist Church Ministry, we are um, offering free lawn care. We cut your grass, trim your hedges, um, take care of your lawn all summer. And all you have to do is give me a call, uh, 334 728. One, two, two, one. The only stipulation is um, the person needing this service need to call me because y'all have me showing up at people's houses and 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 um, <laughs> get me shot and get me going to jail because you think somebody need lawn service. So Lord, make sure the person calls and we'll get to that. Okay, it's absolutely positive. The free is part of um, Minute Action MIA. Mount Vernon Baptist Church. Men is part of our ministry, okay? Uh, Ms. Annie Reese, good evening to you tonight. Mary Thomas, good evening to you, to the MTB Church family as we broadcast not only on this Facebook, but also on uh, Mount Vernon's Facebook page also. Will Smith, good evening to you, my brother. Senior, good evening to you. Tonight is very easy preaching, I mean, teaching tonight is so easy. Uh, Will, to, uh, tonight's teaching so easy, you could even do it. Um, Mary Thomas, uh, Gracie, uh, the teaching is so simple tonight, and it is so familiar. You all are so familiar with it that you all probably could do it yourself. But I thought we would take a look afresh at Acts chapter number three. Miss Yvonne H. Whitfield, good evening to you. Acts chapter number three. And let me set the uh, stage for Acts chapter 3. You remember the church has now been empowered 
with the Holy Spirit. The church has received the Holy Spirit uh, with uh, evidence or with speaking in tongues, the Spirit set upon them as fire. Uh, now that Peter has preached, the church is growing. 3,000 people have united themselves with the church. And chapter number two ends by saying, and they continue daily, meaning the Christians. Uh, they weren't called Christians yet. They were originally called the way. Once uh, they were later called Christians in Antioch and it was a derogatory term, a meaning that you all are going around uh, emulating Christ, um, but it became a, um, a positive uh, thing for Christians. Yeah, you're right, we are emulating and we are doing as best we can to uh, emulate Christ. So, but the original, originally, the followers of Christ were called the way. Lord Jesus, Kwanzaa, call you Anthony, is actually a Bible study. Praise the Lord. What a mighty God we serve. God does hear and answer prayer. So um, they continued daily on one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meats with gladness and singleness of heart. So they were uh, happy to be a Christian and um, they had a singleness of love, the same love one for a mother. Uh, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. Look at the end of verse 47, and the Lord added to his church daily as such as should be saved. I'm so glad that most Baptist churches have gotten out of voting people into the church. The Lord adds to his church. Back in the day, all of us ignorantly, uh, members, what do, what do I hear from you? And uh, let's follow Hitchcock, I think it's Hitchcock Rules of Order. The Lord added to his church daily, such as should be saved. The word saved there is from the word soteria, which means to be rescued, delivered, or set free. And that brings us up to chapter number three, where we want to where we want to lay anchor tonight, Acts chapter number three, and we will, as we always do, allow the text to do the teaching. And if in fact I, I or any other pastor, preacher, teacher allow allows the text to do the teaching, that's called exegesis in, exegesis in the text, exegesis. It's from the word exit to lead out. It allows the text to tell you what the text says. And the opposite of that is leading in. And that's when we put our own opinion, our own spin. We don't let the text lead you out. We personally lead you in to the text, into the story. We want to let the text do the teaching. So I always, when I'm teaching preachers, I always teach them to ask the question, what is the text saying? I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what he, she, it, they are saying. I want to know what is the text saying? So let's look at what the text saying, and we will box this. The first thing the, terse, the text teaches us or tells us is that Peter and John, I mean, verse one, were on a mission. Listen to verse one. Now, Peter and John, remember, they are two of the Lord's closest disciples. He had 12 apostles, disciples slash apostles. Peter and John were two of the three, those who were closest to him. Remember, he had 12, but in the midst of those 12, he had three that he was closer to, Peter, James, and John. Here we have Peter and John on a mission. And the essence of their mission is or the foundation for their, for their mission is togetherness. Look at the text, we don't let it talk to us. Peter and John, now, if you know anything about the disciples, you know Peter uh, and John, they were opposites. One was old, one was young, one had a introvert personality and one had an extrovert personality, but yet they were in harmony. They were together on this mission. They were in unity. And you would be surprised at how much the church Covenant Grace could accomplish if we would only adopt this same philosophy of unity.
togetherness, of oneness. I heard the late Reverend Dr. Edgar Victor Hill say a long time ago, he says, uh, it's impossible for a, for a divided church to defeat a united world. Let me say that again. It's impossible for a divided church for uh, to, to defeat a united world. Ms. Lou, Lou Wilborn, good evening to you. If in fact we're going to defeat a united world, we must get rid of the division. As a matter of fact, the Lord hates division so much until he says, mark them that causes division among you. Mark them, put a sign on them. When new member come around, I mean, I, I know that sounds strange, but he says, put a mark on them that's always running around busybodies causing division among church members. Be careful when you are a busybody because you will have to give an account for, uh, uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ of your messiness. And don't you dare uh, uh, listen to me and watch me at night and think church folk can't be messy. But here in the text, the text says that they were unified and making it up Peter and John, although they were opposites in personality, they found a way to come together for the mission. Where were they going? Okay, so the first thing they were, they were together in where they were going. Where were they, where were they going? The text says, let, let it talk to us, Miss Monetta Wilson. The text says they were, they went up together to the temple. Now the temple was the center of the Jewish religion. Um, yeah, there are basically three temples. Uh, some say more than that, but, but, but we just call it three. That was uh, Solomon's original temple, and then that was the temple under Ezekiel, and then Herod rebuilt the temple and enlarged it. And when, and when you think about temple, don't think of one building, think of a campus. I call it, and one day I, I bring some pictures of the campus. It was a lot. So they, but the temple would be the equivalent to what we call the church. I want to call it church building, but I, I make some preachers mad if I don't. What we call the church building. Now, uh, maybe I shouldn't be, yeah, I'm going down that alley. So basically they were on a mission going to church. Now preachers got grand during the pandemic because for all of our lives, yours, mine, his, and hers, when we thought of the church, we thought of the building. But because pastors wanted to close the doors during the pan pandemic, they got grand and they started saying, well, which is true. Well, the word church in the Bible does not mean the building. Therefore, it's okay for us to close the door because we're really not closing the doors to the church, which, which, was, which was accurate. But they got grand and, and, and learned a, a Greek word, ecclesia. And so they ran around telling everybody that the, the, the word for church is ecclesia, which is, which is correct. But all our lives, we've been referring to the church. When we, when, when we use the word church, normally we talk about the building. Now, the problem is, here, here's the problem etymologically and theologically, and you need to know the difference. The word church in the Bible Remember, the Bible was written in Hebrew, originally translated from Hebrew into uh, um, Greek, and then from Greek into Latin, and then from Latin and Greek, and just a little, bit of, a little bit of Aramaic, not a whole lot. Now, Jesus and his disciples spoke Aramaic, but they were recorded in the Bible in Greek. So we had Hebrew, then we had the uh, Septuagint, which is Greek, then we had the Vulgate, which is Latin, and then around the third, uh, 13th centuries, we had, uh, we start, uh, the 1300s, we start getting the English Bible. Okay, um, who, I, I, I forgot his name was, who, who hand wrote the um, manual scriptus, the manuscript first Bible. Okay, it was in 1300, it didn't go anywhere. And then after the invention of the printing press in about 1450, uh, 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 there were about, William Tyndale in the 1500s came along and printed the first printed English Bible. And then after him, uh, Coverdale came and he printed the entire, entirety of the English Bible. Why did I say that? Because the word church took on different meaning. Oh my God, I probably shouldn't tell y'all that. The word church, ecclesia, took on different meanings as it related to 
um, the culture, because in the Latin Vulgate, if you read the Latin Vulgate, the word ecclesia, they translated that word church to mean the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. It meant the Pope and the bishops and the hierarchy. And they were abusing it. So when William Tyndale translated the Latin, uh, uh, translated the Bible from uh, um, uh, into English, he 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 didn't even use the word church because he wanted to get back to the original meaning of ecclesia. So his Bible would have read, "Upon this rock I build my congregation." Robert, good evening to you. Because the word ecclesia literally means the assembled called out ones. It was so, so they are right. The Bible, when it uses the word church, is etymology from the Greek word ecclesia. I think it's spelled E K K L E S I A. And it always, 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 always means people and not a place. Now, they didn't teach us that back in the old day because the ink, so when they translated the Bible into English, the English word for church is from an, uh, some say it's from a, I, I wrote this down, it's, it's from a, um, a uh, old English word, C I R I C E, which means the place of assembly set, up, set aside for Christian worship. Okay, I'm trying to teach you the difference between the Bible definition for church and the English word church. So when preachers said, so when preachers were saying that the word ecclesia is where we get the word church in the Bible, it never meant a it never meant a place. They were accurate. However, the English word for church does not mean ecclesia. It does not mean the assembly or the called out ones to assemble. It means the place of worship. So for all of our lives, we've been using the English word. And then when those of us who, because I chose to close the doors also for the safety of, of the sheep that God has entrusted me with. Okay. So, but most preachers, because they needed to justify protecting their people, they went to the Greek when they've been in the English for years. Let me give you an example. If the, if the uh, pastor who, if the pastor is in his office and somebody said, where are you? He would say, I'm in my church's office. He wouldn't say, I'm in the church building office. Nobody, when they call the air-conditioned man to re fix, to replace or fix the air condition in the building, say, we are at the Mount Vernon Missionary Church building. No, they say, we're at, the church needs a new air condition. The church needs a new carpet. The church needs a new PA system. The church. So we've always referred to the building as the church. And if you are talking English, that's okay. But you need to understand it because I want you to know, I want you to be knowledge. My people perish because they lack information. I want you to understand when, when we say church, Bible, we are talking specifically about people. But English, we are talking about the building. Okay, so, so let's get back to the text. They're on a mission. Where, where are they going? They're going to the temple or to the church. And if they go to the member and, and they go to the house of worship and they go to the church, guess what, Mary Thomas, coming to Grace Robert Smith, we too have an obligation to get into that place of worship, what we call the church or the church building. Hebrews chapter 10, 25 says, don't stop gathering yourself together for corporate worship as some have. And I know we're in a modern day where well, I can just watch it on TV. I can watch it on Facebook. Devil, there's something about being in the midst of it. You can watch a football game on TV, but you go to a uh, Jordan Hat Stadium and you go to Tuscaloosa, uh, Tuskegee and Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa, and you can watch the party uh, uh, at, at the club on, on Facebook Live, but there's just something, preach boy, about the atmosphere. Peter and John were on a mission and they went to church together. They went to the temple together. They went to the house of God together. That's where they were going. Not only are they together and in unity in where they were going, they were in unity when they were going. The text says they went to the church, they went to the temple, look at it, said, being about the ninth hour. That's Jewish time. 
being about the ninth hour, which would have been about three o'clock p.m. The Jews, in particular the disciples slash apostles, they went to the temple three times a day. They pray. You remember Daniel when they told him not to pray? The Bible said he went upstairs, opened the one that looked toward Jerusalem, and he prayed three times a day. I think David said in Psalm 55, I pray morning, noon, and night. So they were also together, not only in where they were going, which was the church. Now, there used to be a time everybody in the house uh, had to go to church. Now, we'll be adults, we, we will be grown, and we will actually have the nerve preach boy and the unmiss and unmitigated gall and the nerve to ask our children, do you want to go to church? Who does that but an idiot? Who asks their children, do you want to go to church and you are a believer, you believe in Jesus Christ, you believe in the value of the church, you believe in the value of instruction, and you, and you don't have no better idiotic sense but to ask your 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, somebody that you pay in their car, I'm sorry, somebody you buying their clothes, you buying their food, you buying the lights, you buying the gas, you buying the water, and you got the nerve to say, you want to go to church? Yeah, but when I grew up, we didn't have a choice. <laughs> mama said, Saturday night, get your church clothes ready. Even when mama didn't go, she sent us. I don't know whether that would just get us out of the house or whether go get some instruction, but I know she sent us. <laughs> Glory to God. We said on the mission, verse 1, Acts chapter number 3. We led the tech to the talking. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple, our church, at the hour of prayer, being the night hour. They are, so they were on a mission. They were together in where they were going. They were uh, together when they were going. And thirdly, they were together while they were going. They were going to pray. Bible said, the Bible said, Luke 18 and 1, men ought to always pray. The disciples of Jesus came. Um, I know that's right. Uh, the disciples of Jesus came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he said, when you pray, say. And then he goes on to give them the model of prayer. So number one, verse one, I spent 20 minutes on just a mission. They were together. They were in unity. They were in harmony. Glory to God. Psalm uh, 5 Philippians 2 and 2 teaches us that we read later on that we ought to strive for unity in the body. 1 Corinthians 1 and 10 says we ought to strive for unity. Amos 3 and 3 says, how can two walk together and not agree? Now, that doesn't mean we got to agree with everything as we're walking. What that means is if we're going to get to the same place, we got to at least agree where we're going and how we're going to get there. <laughs> My God, we need to eradicate, eliminate division within the body. OK, so that's the mission. The challenge I want to make under the mission is to strive for loop. Strive for unity. Strive for togetherness. Glory to God. And so they were on a mission. And while they were on the mission to go to church, Jesus, I'm sorry, they had an encounter with a man who was already at the church. Not in church, but at church. Okay, verse number two. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate. I told you he was at the church, but not in the church. Because, he, you know, now, now if, if you read the Old Testament, the Jewish law, they didn't think very highly of people who were physically disabled, physically, what we call today physically challenged, challenged handicapped people. I mean, they, they have some strict rules and regulation of things that they just could not partake of or in. They laid, check this out, he, now, so now we leave the mission, that's point one, now we go, go to the man. And there are several things that the text tell us, tells us about the man as we exegete the text. The first thing the text tells us is that he had an unnatural birth. A certain man was lame from his mother's womb. He had what we would call a birth defect. What's my point under this unnatural birth? birth. We don't even know the man's name, but we do know his condition, and his condition was he had an unnatural birth. The condition is he had an unnatural birth. That simply suggests to us, Mary, that this man did not contribute to his condition. 
everybody that has negative conditions uh, did not contribute to, to where they are in, at this stage in their life. God allowed this man, please understand me, and I know this hurts some of us to the heart, God allows bad things to happen to good people. The word is sovereign. God is in complete control. Nothing is happening to you right now. Miss Frazier, Miss Thomas, Grace Tauber, Miss Wilson, uh, nothing is happening to you and to me that God did not either cause or allow. God allows it. God has complete control over everything. He allowed, for some reason or another, God allowed this man. This man was not born um, with the ability to walk, and he was clowning around, feeling and fumbling around, Teresa, uh, uh, playing, and uh, 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 hurt his spine and became crippled. No, somewhere between the uh, coming together of the uh, uh, X and the Y chromosome, the, the, the man was born with a birth defect. Glory to God. But isn't it good news to know? Isn't it good news to know? Isn't it good news, Kwanzaa? Call you Anthony to know it does not matter where you were born or how you were born. God can remake you. God can reshape you. God can make ways out of no way. God is still doing the impossible. Devil. Um, um, in order for God to show that he is a healer, somebody got to get sick. If God, in order, in, in, in order for God to show that you can still have joy when you get cancer, that's why he allowed me to get cancer. Doctor told me five years ago, you got cancer. I said, cool. He said, how the world could you say, cool? I said, because God is sovereign and because I got cancer, God going to do one of three things. He's going to heal my body. That's what I'm praying for. He's going to give me the strength to live with it. That's okay. Or he's going to take me home. I forgot the fourth, I forgot the fourth way and then he's going to get it taken out. <laughs> so they took it out. Glory to God. And my testimony has been to men with prostate cancer. I tell it just like it T-I-E is ill. And you'd be surprised at how many females have contacted me and said, I thank you for telling it. Now I understand what my boo is going through. God allows bad. This, this man was born this way. But yet God, oh my God, is going to make a way out of no way God's going to get some praise God's going to get some glory God's going to get some honor he had a birth defect he had a birth defect unnatural birth born crippled never got the chance to run as a child never got the chance to climb ne never got a chance to do everything children did all of his life somebody had to carry him under man, first thing he had was an unnatural birth. Secondly, he had some unsung hero. Oh my God, preacher, this is a preacher. The man has some unsung hero. Pastor, show me some unsung, unsung heroes in the text. Verse two, certain man laying from his mother's womb. That's the birth defect. I'm telling y'all, the text will tell you what to preach. That's your right, but God, check this out, was carried they're the unsung hero because we don't even know their name. We don't even know who they are. Was carried whom they laid day, every day. They carried him and laid him at the gate of the temple, the church, which is called Beautiful. Notice this. See, y'all would have missed this if y'all weren't listening to the text. The unsung heroes every day, they would go back. I don't know whether they were family. I don't know whether they were friends. I don't know whether they were in. I don't know who they were. I like them because we don't know who they are. Glory to God. And when you help people, when you carry people, when you bless people, you got to come to the, you got to adopt the attitude. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you call them a name. Some folk won't even pick paper up in the church unless you call their name. They won't do anything unless they're going to get some public credit. The unsung heroes are those who help 
and never tell anybody. They're the one that bless you when you're hungry and never tell anybody. They're the one that take you to work when you uh, 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 when you got a car but you don't have any money for some gas or they give you gas money and don't tell anybody. They're the one that carry you when you can't carry yourself and don't tell anybody. It's not important that you call my name. It's not important that you tell anybody what's important. And see, when I help people, I get mad when they pay me. I say, you couldn't, I say, you messing with my blessing. Got, I, I got this old lady that I, this, she's a, well, it's not important that, uh, that, that she Caucasian, but I, but, but I always, but well, you know, I, I cut her grass and I, I do things and then she mess around, um, um, middle of the top, then, but she mess around. She said, how much are you? You don't owe me anything. You don't owe me, you don't owe me anything, but then she want to go out and buy me a flower and buy me a $50 flower. I said, devil, if you're going to buy me a $50 flower, you might as well just give me the money. Cause this flower gonna die. What am I saying? You unsung hero of those who, and don't you sit there looking at me like ain't nobody carried you. And I said that the way I want to say it. Like ain't nobody helped you and kept it to themselves. Those are the unsung hero. They carry him every day. I don't think I can carry you every day. Now I carry you sometimes, but I'm not gonna carry you every you, you talking about you, you talking about they must have cared about him, and I don't know whether they were the same people, whether they alternate. All I know is some unsung hero that we we don't know their name thought enough of this man to carry him every day. Let me ask you a question. Why nobody concerned about carrying you? How you living that ain't nobody, ain't no, let me keep saying it, just as country as I feel it. How you living ain't nobody carrying you. How you living ain't nobody helping you. How you living don't nobody want to be bothered with you. How you living people see you walking out of gas on the side of the road and they don't even blow, they just keep, how you living? That nobody wants to be your unsung hero. You need to check your life. If nobody ever is is trying to help you you need to check your life and see if you're not reaping what you sow glory to god this man we dealt with the mission the only way to church we got the where they going we got when they going we got how they going and we got the time now we, we're on the man first of all he had an unnatural birth that's what the text tells us secondly he has some unsung hero turn to matthew chapter 6 verse number 3 Night. It's taking too long. I thought that as long as I've been teaching this day, I thought I could do it in 30 minutes. Uh, Matthew 6 3. It says, uh, verse 3, but when thou doest arm, do arm that mean given to the poor. Let not your left hand know what your right hand does. Do it. <laughs> do it. Verse 4. That that arm may be in secret. The arm and what you give ought to be in secret. Now, they want to tell it. That's on them. <laughs> Glory to God. If somebody want to tell, this is what my mother did for me. This is what Pat did for me. This is what Mary did for me. This is what Minister Dan Tarver did for me. This is what, con if, if you want to tell it, that's fine. But the, but the giver shouldn't do the telling. He said, because if you give in secret, your father would see it in secret, shall reward you openly. That's why I tell them, no, look, I, I want God to reward me. You, you don't have enough money to pay me. <laughs> Glory to God. You don't have enough money to pay me. So leave me alone. Let me do the work. Leave me alone. Let me do the work. And let God pay me. <laughs> His account much bigger than yours. Oh, my God. <laughs> There's too many people looking and start begging. Okay, check this out. This man had an unnatural birth. No matter how you were born. You remember Jesus was born in Bethlehem but grew up in Nazareth. And then one disciple said, can any good thing come from that? Yeah, the Messiah came from it. So it doesn't matter how you were born. It doesn't matter which side of the railroad track you grew up on. It doesn't matter how trifling your mom and your daddy were. It does not matter how much poverty you were born in. You can... Oh my God, God, you can turn it around through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's turned around so many lives. Why don't you let him turn yours around? Why won't you allow him to turn your life 
around by giving your heart to him, by confessing your sins, inviting him into your heart, believing in his finished work on the cross, and then getting in a Bible teaching church, a church that will teach you the mission was to come together and challenge you to be on one accord and will challenge you to stop making excuses about your unnatural birth and will challenge you to be unsung heroes based on the word of God, to help people and keep your mouth shut. Okay, number, number one, they, this man had an unnatural birth. We let the tech do the talking. Number two, he had, an un, he, he had unsung hero. Thirdly, he had an unusual occupation. Check, check out his occupation. Verse number two. At the gate, called beautiful, at the temple, to ask of arms to them that entered into the temple. His occupation was he was begging. Lord, that's shame. He just begging. Well, I don't have a problem with this man begging because there were no social services. There were no organizations. There were no um, um, places that they can go and get help. The only at the end, the Jews were obligated to help the poor. He was a beggar. But I like him because he swallowed his pride and asked for what he needed. Ain't too proud to beg. You don't have to beg. There are people God will put in your life. You don't have to beg. All you got to do is ask. If you treat people right, but you can't treat people wrong and expect them to bless you. That's idiotic. If you learn how to treat People, people will do you right. But y'all, like I think I told y'all before, Fred Sapper said, folks, slow down, they'll steal your glass. I mean, they'll steal your false teeth and smile at you with your own false teeth in the morning. You can't treat people low down and evil, talk about them, gossip on them, and then expect, and then there you are with your hand out. The devil is a lie. We want to help you, but most of the time we ain't. A bad pastor. You know, we, we wrong if we don't help because the Bible said we ought to be blessed out here in a minute. But that's a hard pill to swallow. That's a hard pill to swallow. Evangelist Brown covering the grace, the AD to my DC. That's a hard pill to swallow when folk been uh, uh, misusing you. But Jesus said, you got to love them, you got to feed them, you got to, oh my God. Teach you right, Pastor. And, if I, and I'm not telling you not to help them. I'm telling you it's a struggle. And if you don't help them, if I don't help them, we sin. I don't care how much they did to us, lied on us, talked about us. If, if they need help and we don't help them, I'm talking about me too. We're guilty of sin and we need to repent and do better. I'm not going to get on here and act like, and, and, and act like if I don't help my enemies, it's right. It ain't right. It's wrong. It's sin. It sets a bad example. So y'all pray for pastor. Okay. <laughs> Hold up. Okay, I'm not going to repeat that. My mother. Okay, but our goal is, Miss Cole, Kim Coleman, good evening to you. Our goal is to get to the point where we can even bless those that despitefully use us. Glory. That's our challenge. That's my challenge to you. All right, so the, the mission is in verse one, the man, he had an unnatural birth, he had an unsung heroes, he had an unusual occupation, glory to God. He was in survivor, survival mode. And when you down and you out and you don't have anything and you um, 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 had an unnatural birth and people carrying you and laying you at the gate called beautiful, check this out. He was at a beautiful gate, but he had an ugly problem. You can be at a beautiful place and have a ugly problem. I like this man because he's in survival mode. He says, I got to do what I got to do. You remember the woman? You went to the prophet, the prophet said, and she said, they get me to come get my sons, man, and my son, and, and, and my husband served you faithfully. He said, what you got in your house? He said, hey, why you go borrow some vessels? And I ask you again, how you living that you can't borrow something from people? How you living? That's a rhetorical question. 
He had, un he had an unusual occupation. He was in survival mode. He was begging. He was begging. Do what you got to do until you can do better. Just don't get comfortable on welfare. Don't get comfortable on food stamps. And see, one of the problems with uh, people who have an unnatural birth or a birth defect, they get comfortable in their condition. And they start acting like this is the way it's going to always be. The devil is a liar. God, things can change. And often things do change when you have the Lord Jesus Christ working on your behalf through the power of the Holy Spirit. The man was in survival mode. All right, the mission, verse one, uh, the man, all right, verses two, three, and, and three. Now let's look at the miracle. Let's look at the miracle. We're talking about the mission, the man, and the miracle because the man was looking for some money, but God had a miracle with his name on it. I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm not a prophet. I'm just a country preacher who loves to teach. That's all. Check this out. The man woke up that morning. What you gonna do today? Same thing I've been doing. Y'all carry me, lay me at the beautiful gate. You get through, uh, uh, leave me there. I'm gonna beg for arms. I'm, 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 I'm coming back with some money. But little did he know, God was going to intervene and today would be his day. The today would be, thank God, Peter and John was on a, were on a mission, were on a mission because had they been disobedient and not went to the church, God never could have manipulated the situation. So them, so them being, on a, they being on a mission met the man. And because they were on a mission and met the man, the man got the miracle. You don't know who God is going to use to bring you your miracle, or you don't know if God is going to use you to give somebody a miracle, and God is manipulating stuff, and the man is at the church, and you at home. The man wasn't in church. He was at church. They left him at the beautiful gate to beg for when church people would go into the temple and then they would give. You don't know who God going to use to get you a miracle. Or God, or you don't know when God is going to use you. Evangelists said they were at the right place at the right time. Why? Because they went to church consistently. <laughs> Had it been like some of y'all, they would have missed the opportunity. I got kinfolk at home. I can't go. Well, somebody may need you to uh, uh, to initiate that miracle. My head hurt. I don't feel like going. Somebody may. They, the reason the man got the miracle was because the mission was consistent. Peter and John consistently three times a day with the church. It happened at the church, Mary. Not in the church, at the church. I wish I could have been there. I would have said, look, if you can, take him in the church. You're right, Evander. We don't know who and we don't know when. Take, because there's healing in the church. There are miracles in the church. There, there, now, now, check that out. Now, one thing we learn here is God's miracles are not confined to the church. Now, this man is not in the church. He's at the church. Or the church comes to him, ecclesia, the body, glory to God. The members came to him. Check out the miracle, verse number eight. First thing we see is the miracle occurred because Peter and John made a connection. I'm not making it up. Verse, verse four, no, no, and the connection was eye to eye. They looked at him and didn't look over him. You're right, Tammy, they probably couldn't have taken him in because of this defect. But if they could have, get him in the church. But Healing can't be confined to in the church. Thank y'all. I'm going to go down that alley. Miracles can't be confined to in the, in the church building. Okay. Um, deliverance. Your joy. Your peace. Your happiness. Your shouting. Your show do lo molita. Rada madosa. It cannot be confined. I'm not a tongue talker, but my wife here. It cannot be confined to the church. As I told y'all last week, I'm not against tongues. I just don't understand them. 
Okay, but your religion cannot be confined to the building. And this is one of the things that it teaches us. He's at church, not in church, but the church came to him because they were on a mission. Look at verse number eight. He made contact. See, y'all too busy looking over people when you ought to look at people. I find this fascinating, this, this contact that he made with him, this connection that he made with him. Verse number eight, Peter and, I'm sorry, uh, verse three, who seen Peter and John about to go into the church, ask him for some money. Now, notice what it said. They saw, he saw Peter and John. But notice what it, verse four said. Peter fed his eyes on him, said, look, I thought he was already looking at y'all. No, more than likely what happened between verse 3 and verse 4, the man dropped his head in shame. And I want to tell somebody that's going through, don't you dare be ashamed when your condition is not something that you call. Devil, you don't even need to be ashamed if you call the condition. Why? Because we all make mistakes. We all blow it. We all do dumb stuff. I'm 63 years old and I still do dumb stuff. I know y'all got it together. I know y'all never do dumb stuff. Okay? I know y'all, I know y'all, uh, I, I know most of y'all super saved. Y'all super saved and super saved. But I'm 63 years old and I still do dumb stuff where I have to go to God. And my conscience said, now you know that one, right? You know you shouldn't have said that. You know you shouldn't have done that. You know you had the wrong spirit. You know you had the wrong attitude. You know you went off. And at 63, I know when I'm in a bad mood. I, I, you know, I take this medicine, and I know when I'm in a bad mood. So when I'm in a bad mood, when I'm in a bad mood, I try to stay away from people. But I still blow it. Check this out. The man lowered his head. And I don't care how down you are. You hold your head up. Because all of us make mistakes. I know that I know there are people who gonna who 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 you can live good, Melissa, all your life. Mary, you can live good 99% of your life, make one mistake, and people wanna hold that one mistake to you. They, they wanna act like that's all you ever did. <laughs> Glory to God. The devil is a liar. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hang my head because I messed up. Now, there are mess ups and there are mess ups. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! There are okay. There are there are some mess up where I probably would hang my head. But those of us who are saved, we not. I'm not talking about little big sins. I'm talking about consequences. I mean, we ain't gonna go rob no bank. You know, we we not gonna uh, um, 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 go out and lay with somebody, hug with somebody wife. I mean, we not. I mean, yeah, but yeah, we got issues, but we ain't got those kind of issues. I'm not saying one sin bigger than the other and all sin will kill you. I'm just saying the more you grow, the more of these kind of sins of, of, of the flesh, well, I'll say the flesh, uh, uh, the more you grow, the more you want to grow. <laughs> and the more of certain kind of sins, you just outgrow. <laughs> I mean, either time, <laughs> pain, or the good Lord say, look, it's time out for that foolishness. That doesn't mean we're perfect. That just means we have more control over our flesh in certain areas. Okay? All right. So number one, they made contact. The man had obviously hung his head because in verse number four, Peter fastened his eyes on him, didn't look over him, but looked at him. Said, look on us, meaning Look, brother, we looking at you. Look, get your head up, oh ye gates. <laughs> oh my God. I will lift up my eyes into the hills from which comes my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12. You don't have anything to hold you. Well, if you repent and come back to God, you don't have anything to be ashamed of. Okay? All right, but if you feel guilty, that's a good sign. It's a good sign if you sin and you feel guilty and you feel dirty and you feel ashamed and you feel condemned. That means you have a conscience. Okay, that means you have some God in you that lets you know 
what you just did is wrong or even more importantly, what you are about to do is wrong. Okay. We're on the miracle now. He, they connected to him. They said, look on us. Verse five. Uh, he, uh, uh, in the midst of the um, connection, he complied. He, he looked at them. And he looked at him expecting to receive of them. More than likely, he expected to receive some money because money was what he thought he needed. Okay. He, he had become comfortable in his condition because he thought that, because that's all he knew. And some of you, now I don't, I say this all the time, and my wife shouldn't say that, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I don't necessarily, I'm gonna say it this way. I'm about changing my mind about um, generational curses. I've always rejected that idea that there is a phenomenon called generational curses. Because when I was matriculating at Troy University, getting my master's degree in counseling, they taught me that people learn three ways, opera conditioning, classical conditioning, and modeling. That's how, that's how we get behavior. Opera conditioning, uh, Pavlov's dog, the classical conditioning, and modeling. And I'm a firm believer that most behavior is modeled. It's not one spirit moving down to another. It is people see a behavior, children, and they mimic that behavior. But I'm about, I'm, I'm that close, Reverend Stoke and my letter, to changing my mind. Maybe there is a such thing as a generational curse that we need to break. I know we need to stop all this negative modeling. Okay? But this all the man knew. If all you know is poverty, if all you know is poverty, is if, if, if all is, if, if all you know is the third life, if all you know is the gang life, if all you know is the whore life, if all you know is the tramp life, is all if all you know is the angry life, if all if, if that's all you know, that's all you're going to be. This all the man knew was glory to God. All this man knew was begging. Things about the chain, the miracle, the connection, the compliance. But then there is a contribution that they did. I, I like this. Let the text talk. Pastor, show us where the text is. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. Okay. In other words, translate it, I don't have any money. Okay. I don't have any money. So no doubt the man was disappointed. <laughs> so, so duh, keep it moving, brother. I need some money. And I am talking to somebody tonight who thinks you need money. Well, I mean, well, you probably do, but what you really need is a miracle. Okay? Uh, Miss Monella says she believes in generational curse. Cool. I mean, I'm, I don't have a problem with it. My wife believes in them too. My wife said, some of these little demons, two and three years old, that's, I say, cool. I don't argue. I just, I'm not sure. It's kind of like tongues. I'm not, I'm not telling you not talking tongues. I'm telling you I don't understand tongues. Okay, and one day if I understand them, and maybe I will talk into them. I, uh, I do understand the phenomenon that's called generational curses, and I'm about leaning that way. <laughs> okay, uh, see, see, um, and uh, verse six. Then Peter said, "Seven go have I none? I ain't, I ain't got no money for you, brother." And no doubt the man probably said, "Well, Doug, keep moving." Now check this out. I call this the contribution. Pastor, show me where the text says they gave a contribution. But such as I, as I have, give I thee. They said, man, I'm going to contribute a gift to your cause. <laughs> Check this out. You can't give something you don't have. You can't give somebody something you don't have. So Peter is saying, I have something that's more valuable than money. I have something that money can't buy and it's great and, and it's based on grace. How do I know it's based on grace? Because I'm going to give it to you. You don't have to earn it. I'm glad I can tell somebody that certain thing money just came by. I know you think you need more money. You don't need more money. You need a miracle. That's why your money keep running out and you need more and more and more and more because you are asking God for money when you ought to be seeking a miracle. 
And I'm not talking about no fly by night, overnight miracle. I'm talking about a miracle with a plan. Uh, Peter gave this man a plan. And I told y'all once, I believe I'll tell you again, that pastor has a plan. Yeah, he's going to tell you to bring him eight, nine thousand dollars so that you can get your miracle. The devil is a liar. Let me bring you one dollar and you get your miracle. Because if you are in anybody's prayer line, if you are anybody in, in, in anybody prophetic, if you're getting somebody's prophetic word, if they don't give you a plan, get your money back. Number one, you shouldn't be paying for a prophetic word anyway. But if you're comfortable paying, I, you know, do you. Whatever God leads you to do. What I'm saying to you is, at least leave that with a plan. Because pastor got a plan. Let me say, see, pastor tell you, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm not condemning pastor. I'm condemning a certain kind who want to tell you, come get in my prayer line, and I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to give you a prophetic word, and in 21 days, God going to give you a new car. No, he ain't. Because he didn't give you a plan. He didn't give you. See, pastor got a plan. Let me, uh, let me tell you pastor plan. Pastor plan is. Pla pastor got a plan for prosperity. His plan is. I'll get me a church. And I'll get my income from the parishioners. That's a plan. Pastor ain't coming to church saying, look. I just preach for free and just let the Lord, you know, pastor, pastor know where his income coming from. And it ain't no miracle. <laughs> preach, get around the oldest boy. And then pastor, well, if I don't get enough income from my parishioner, I have some revival. That's the plan. Ain't no miracle in, in that. Ain't no fly by night, wash your poker, dumb and local. No, it's the plan. Don't get enough money from the revival. I sell my tapes. That's a plan. Don't get a look uh, from the tape. I'll do a broadcast and put my cash app up there. What am I trying to tell you? Pastor, we pastors have a plan. We know where our income is coming from. Because we because we got a plan. But yet many want to send you away without a plan and expect God to just do it. God is going to do it. Go your butt back to school. God is going to do it. Go to money management class. God is going to do it. Take that uh, $200 a week TV back in rental center and save your money. God is going to do it. Get you a bus pass until you can get a, a, a until you can afford. God is going to do it. Don't buy the doing and bird bird. God is going to do it. But you must get a plan. And I'm teaching this better than y'all better than y'all receiving it. Give me no prophetic word to my no hope hocus pocus dominocus and in 18 days you're gonna get a new job. No, you better go get qualified. No, I said no loach pocus. I said hocus pocus dominocus. <laughs> you better go get qualified for the job. Now, now it, it, there is an exception to this rule. Yes, God gives some people jobs they're not qualified for. That's not the norm. Yes, yes, God gives people cars that they're not quite. That's not the norm. The normal way is you get decent credit. You pay your bills on time. You get your credit score up to at least, I think it used to be 669. I think it's almost seven. Oh, it's over seven now. That's a plan, boo. You know, hocus pocus, dumb. No, 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 no. Okay, Peter. Peter says, I'm going to contribute. I'm going to give you something. I'm going to give it to you because I, I got it. And all I'm trying to do is give you what I got. I can't give you what I don't have. God has given me wisdom. He's given me knowledge. I try to share with you all. Why? Because my people perish because they lack information. He says, Sylvan Gold ain't got none, but I got something I want to give you. In the authority and the power of of Jesus Christ. Now, in order to use the power of Jesus and give him something related to the power, he, he had to have it. He had to have it. People cannot give you something they don't have. Preparation. People cannot give you something that they don't have. If, not, if, if they don't have success, how can they give you the plan to success? But please, if you don't get anything from this point, understand we pastors got plans. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, let me.
me get through with this because I'm not, I, I'm not going to even get to the message tonight. All right. And then, most importantly, so not only was their connection compliant, he says, I'm going to contribute, but then he challenged him. This may be the most important part. He challenged him. Notice what he says here. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. The purpose for you hearing a sermon is to first of all challenge you to change. Problem with so many people, Manella and Miss Reese and uh, Miss Stokes and Mary Thomas, and, is that there are so many people living beneath their privilege and y'all won't challenge them. Peter said to the man, to the man, he challenged, get up and walk. Ain't got no money for you. Get up and walk. No doubt the man said, me. <laughs> man, I ain't never walked. Peter says, get up and walk. Sometimes those people that you are 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 thank you helping, but you're hurting because you haven't changed, you, because you haven't challenged them to change. And that's why some, I'm not talking about all, there are some good prophets, some good prophetess, there are some great preachers, but that's why some prophets never challenge you with a plan because as long as they don't challenge you to change, you can keep on coming back to them for that same prophetic word. No, I say, no, no, stop eating all that fat back. Stop eating all them hog mold. I'm challenging you to change. I want you to live. You too fat. Challenging you to change. Stop dating that married man. Give him back his key. Challenging you to change. Change your attitude. You got a nasty attitude. The reason people don't like you is because you're not likable. Challenge people to change. Stop going out so much. Your eight-year-old child needs you at home. Challenge people to change. Let me go down that. Stop cursing so much. Now, I mean, you used to curse every now and then. Now you curse every other word. Challenge, and they get mad because you challenge them to change. You weren't their friend anyway. Stop being scared to challenge people. Peter said, man, anybody got more money for you? Here it is. Get up and walk. Man, man, get up. Get out of this house and go look for a job. Duh. Challenge people to change. Stop drinking so much liquor. You're ruining your liver. Challenge People to change. Stop staying at home on Sunday morning. You missing the corporate worship. You 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 disobey God. God ain't pleased. Challenge people to change. Peter says the challenge here it is. He said, "Get up and get up and walk." One more, and I'm through. Not the money. Not only did he make connection, gave a contribution, challenge him to change. Finally. That was a collaborative effort. Here it is, Pat. Here it is. Here's the collaborative effort. And he took him by the right. He didn't just give him a word. He helped him. It was a collaborative effort. He said, brother, I'm going to use my faith for you. Ah, oh, my God. Right above me and see. He says, I am going to help you stay. It's all right to challenge me. It's all right. It, it, it's all right to contribute to me by giving me what you got. It's all right to make a connection with me. But make it a collaborative effort. The Bible says he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Whose faith is it? This is Peter's faith. It, it, this man faith that whether he's going to get some money. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones received that strength. For the first time in his life, this brother stood up and somebody said, he's standing up so good, he began to trot, 
Triton felt so good, he picked up the pace. And Triton felt so good, he began to run. And here it is, verse 8. Running felt so good, he began to leap, stood up, walked, and entered into the church. No way he went to church. God keep giving y'all miracles and you keep and you keep ignoring the church. And I mean the building now. Walking and leaping and know what he did. He went in there praising the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. He went, he said, thank God. I can walk. First time in his life. God can turn your situation around. I promise you he, he can. But you got to trust him. You got to trust him. You don't need money. You need a miracle. I mean, you do need money, but as a matter of fact, the miracle may be getting some money. So don't anybody, I mean, so I don't want to act like we don't need money. We do. We got bills to pay. But there are certain things that money cannot buy. That's it for tonight, y'all. Wednesday night. Let me do a quick review. Uh, Acts chapter 3, we talked about the mission. They were together. They had unity in where they were going. They were going to the church. When they were going, it was 3 p.m. and why they were going. What the challenge? Get them to go to church and make sure you're promoting unity when you go to church. Point two, well, the man, uh, the man, he had an unnatural birth. He, he had unsung heroes. He had an unusual occupation. And then we talked about the miracle. Peter connected with him. He contributed to him, he challenged him, and then he collaborated with him. That's about seven or eight different sermons there. <laughs> oh, God, is good. All the time. Let me challenge you tonight. If you're not born again, get born again. Pray, pray, pray the prayer of faith. I tell my preachers, every time you teach, you go by the cross, not get him up, but you challenge people to get saved. If I tell all my preachers, somewhere in your sermon, in your presentation, the most important mission that we have is to get people to turn their lives over to Jesus. It's a pretty simple prayer. Lord, come into my heart. Come into my heart. And God, I repent of my sins. Lord, be my God. Be my master. I believe in you. And he says, he that believeth in me should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then you start to grow. Get in you a Bible teaching church. A pastor who wants to exegete, not eisegete a text. Let the text do the talking. Okay? Don't forget the two different words for church. Okay? Don't forget ecclesia is the Greek word. It means the symbols called out ones. It was literally a secular term for when the ruling governing body would assemble for, for business. They were called the ecclesia. When the church started assembling, it took the word to me in the assembly of those who were called out. Believers, the English word for church, literally as particularly the noun means the building. Know the difference, okay? That's it for tonight. God bless y'all. Ooh, Sunday morning, I think we'll complete our study in Matthew, or we may be through with that, and um, we're also through with our study. We've gone all the way through the Gospel of John of, uh, up to the crucifixion. On Sunday morning, we expositorily taught all of Matthew up to the crucifixion. And on Tuesday night, we'll go to Luke. And on Sunday morning at Mount Vernon, we will go to Mark. So we're going to teach all four Gospels and uh, up to the crucifixion. And then we're going to teach the crucifixion as one because there's some uh, discrepancies and there are some differences between the time periods between the Roman time and the Jewish time. So we're going to say the, the actual crucifixion when we do the harmony of the crucifixion when we get through. Who God bless y'all. Keep y'all is my prayer. Until next time, God bless y'all. Peace. Wassalamu alaikum.